and welcome back to another episode with Fight Night Picks. As always, we're brought to you by Simbody. Vertiball is now Simbody. If you head on over to their website, Simbody.com, you're going to get all the great products that you know and love, including the Simbody Vertiroller and the Vertiball that you have seen most likely here in studio. Look at that. Place it, lock it, attach it, Vertiball, all sorts of great stuff over there if you want to roll out those old tired muscles and you don't want to go with that old lacrosse ball. They are also coming out with that very new product that you can see right in front of you. And if I head on over to my cart, look at that. I've already got a Vertiball over there. A little bit of a deal right there. And if you hit the try for 60 days risk-free, use the promo code FNP and you're going to get 10% off your order. With that code FNP at Simbody.com, you're really really helping out another local company here in new brunswick canada can't wait for it the new name simbody at simbody.com and as we always say let's get into it you know the guys from fight night picks for their weekly ufc previews and predictions live shows like question mark kicks and the sidekick thanks to your support they're adding a new show to the channel if you're an mma fan you're going to want to join in the action of dana white's contender series so as they always say, let's get into it. Just like that, we're back, we're set, and we're live for Dana White's Contender Series, Week 7 of 2022. As always, one half of your host to do it, Craig Allen, Twitter and Instagram, at Craig Allen FNP. You can find Matt, Matt Allen FNP, down below. And you can see it, I mean, you can find us at Fight Night Picks as well. But Matt, when we do look at the week that we had even just last week i mean week number six you had all five winners getting contracts kinoshita builder who kicked off the card dudakova which was a bit of a surprise because her fight wasn't all that great but they said hey she got hurt and she fought well so we'll give her a contract anyway uh you also had rebeshki and dumas in that co-main event spot so a lot of great fights that we had last week it was probably the most talent rich card that we've had so far and then looking ahead to this week, I mean, you can see it right next to us. You can see it over there in the comments section. We have that poll that's up there. Petrino on the right-hand side of the screen taking on Bellato that is on the left. And for some of these guys, I mean, fighting on this card, a lot of Brazilian talent. There a lot is, of fighters yeah. here that have taken advantage of the LFA going down to Brazil and having fights there. Matt, I know you're excited about this week, and especially this main event. We have fights that are taking place at heavyweight, yeah, at welterweight, at light heavyweight. These are divisions that really do need a little bit of a 100%. refresher. So we'd love to see that. I mean, over in the comments section, Frenzy YQ right on time. Let's get some money this weekend, fellas. Buttertoast is saying, let's go. And uh, Jester's saying, I'm wearing a Bears Cutler jersey. It says Browns. Jester says Browns. It's actually an old Baker Mayfield jersey. Yikes. I'm so sad. But Matt, when we do look ahead to this week, again, very much looking forward to it. And multiple weeks where all five winners have gotten contracts. I think there's a lot of really good talent on this card this week. I agree 100%. When you think about Combat Sports Brothers, who name starts with B, you're probably thinking about the Buffer Brothers. You know, probably the most the, popular two the, men. Burns Brothers. <laughs> or the Burns Brothers. They come to mind as well. But the Bonfim Brothers are pretty hot right now, and they're looking to make their stamp on this week of Contender Series. I gotta be honest, I'm a little surprised one of the two brothers isn't involved in the main event, just because it does feel like the brothers themselves have gotten a lot of the spotlight this week. So, I'm really excited to see how they do, because I feel like it's almost a guarantee, and I know they've done this a lot lately, how ooh, all the winners get contracts, but if two brothers on the same show end up both winning, I, I really do expect them to both get contracts, and they're both pretty high level, but they are taking on high level opposition too so i'm excited for a lot of these fights and we do have some short notice replacements to fill you in on we'll touch on the weigh-ins especially for this week everybody made weight so you love to see that a little bit of a discrepancy in the fight that's at heavyweight but as we always do on this show we start with the first fight whip it on all the way up through the entire card and at the end or maybe if we're so incensed during that particular fight we'll give you the one pick matt the curse it's broken I'm it's broken the time. but yours is but the curse is broken so matt uh we see from kurtar how's there due to 31 fights on this card yeah, that's kind of wild. It is like, wild. But that's the thing. That fight is very high level, though. Like, if that was the first fight on a UFC Fight Night card, nobody would bat an eye at it because I do think both of them are high level enough to actually make it to the UFC. Well, we will kick it off, Matt, with the first fight that is on this card. And we have Teresa Bleda taking on, and this is going to be a fun one, Nayara Maya. But if you go out and you do the tape study and you try and watch her fights, it's not Nayara Maya. It's Nayara Arno. So that's who you're going to be looking for if you're trying to watch 
tape on her. But if we focus on Bleda just to start, I mean, my for the Czech native, she's been all the hotness for as long as she's been in MMA. Definitely. Undefeated as an amateur. She went 6-0 and over there, 5-0 and already as a pro. And for Bleda... Matt, we talked about her a couple of weeks ago with Lucia Pudzilova coming back into the UFC because Pudzilova was in an octagon tournament in 2020 and she lost to a 19-year-old Bleda. Isn't that wild? It is. And the craziest part about it is, and I know a lot of people focused on it, well, nobody knew what the rules of the tournament were. Octagon threw it on just to kind of get some people some combat experience, get them moving at the height of the pandemic, which is all fair. But Bleda had a lot of success in that one fight. I was overly critical of it in the Pudzilova prediction for Wu Yan Nan. But when I do focus in on for Teresa Bleda, I love the level of competition that she's faced throughout this run. I know her nickname on Tapology is considered Ronda. I read a couple of interviews, one by Extra.CZ, another one by Top Fight CZ. So over in Chechia, that's where they're doing those interviews. And she said that used to be my nickname when I was an amateur. They kind of gave it to me on the way up, but don't have a nickname right now. Not going to go by that uh, moniker. But if you do watch her fight, she doesn't really fight like Ronda Rousey. She is a wrestler for sure, but she's not going for a lot of upper body throws. She's not a, a, a judo player. She's going to run in, try and grab a double leg. And she really does have great entries on those takedowns. So you love to see it. Very high level for a very, very young fighter. But again, I consider this. She's 20 years old. She does have some very good experience. The fights that I really like to hone in on, the fight against Martins. Martins wasn't just some Brazilian fighter that they bring over to Europe and, hey, you beat a Brazilian. You're you're going to be the champion. She fights Martins and has a little bit of a hard time. Every time she goes in to close the gap, Martins goes in to pull guillotine. A couple of them are very tight, round one, round two. But if you look at it, Bleda is able to kind of keep position keep pace and then get out of it and spend meaningful amount of time on top her fight where she won the belt over with octagon the flyweight belt was against mabelli uh, lima who's on dana white's contender series in the past and in that fight well she looked amazing but also looked like a weight class bigger and that's the other thing for blada she also has bantamweight experience as a pro and as an amateur she's a very big flyweight she is and she just used it to her advantage she's like a wet blanket on top of a lot of fighters when she is able to get that position and you're right she's an intelligent grappler and she shows the ability to fight out of tough situations and then make it dominant for herself again the thing is maya herself is a good grappler she's somebody who can jump on defensive submissions go for guillotines and whatnot make it uncomfortable on the ground no matter what position she's in and that's why this fight should be really good. We could get like a Tim Kennedy, Louis Smolka type affair in this one. So it could be a fun fight in that aspect. The problem is, I do think Blade just is a higher level grappler. I think these fighters are very similar. I just think Blade has her sliders turned up. Maybe not even 10% more, maybe even 20% more. I do like her style of grappling towards MMA a lot more because here's the thing. With Maya, she can finish with submissions, don't get me wrong, but I worry about her losing a lot of the minutes and a lot of the moments in between those bigger actions. And with Blade Da, at least I do like her top control a little bit more. So we're okay. Let's say it doesn't end in a finish. Neither fighter is able to get a submission. The judges are probably going to reward Blade Da for a lot of her top control and her grappling other than Maya. Yeah, and I mean, when you do look at this one for Maya, trains at a Nova but she does have a very good grappling pedigree she is the budo sento flyweight champion her last time out she got a win over a fighter that you might recognize it was reina cordoba who had just beaten zoila frosto so that one carries some weight but that fight was in 2019 and then they paired these two up in 2022 and i thought geez isn't reina cordoba old yeah, she was 42 taking that fight. And she looked pretty good at the start of it. She had success in the striking. She was going for those head and arm judo tosses. And she was getting them against Maya until Maya was finally able to get on top, flatten out the back, and then just hammer away, threaten with some submissions. But if you do look at this one, I mean, Maya, I consider her the better striker. She kind of walks in with reckless abandon and just throws and doesn't really respect the power of any of her opponents. And then when she goes for a takedown, it's very much body lock to trip or body lock to upper body throw so for Maya she grapples in a different way than Bleda Bleda obviously the much younger fighter both of these women champions and the much younger fighter is Bleda so I think it's a good fight I I might not throw a pick out here just yet but I will say this one and we don't really touch on the odds as much on this show but I will say it for this fight match Bleda is a massive favorite open open minus 300 minus 630 right now Maya open plus 250 
plus 428. So a giant favorite is Blade. Uh, I think it's somewhat justified, but it's always surprising to see something like that. It is, but I do feel like with her youth and with her skill set, she's someone who can improve a lot fight between fight. So we could even see a leveled up version of her in this matchup too. EPH Brothers throwing that one down there. Aaron saying I've got Bellato 2 MPTV hanging out in the chat. Nelly Morris is ready for some fights. And there's a lot of people that are looking forward to these ones coming up this week. So our next fight, Matt, we have the first of the two Bomfin brothers. And for the first one, this at 155 pounds, it's Ishmael Bomfin, 17-3, and three, taking on a tough guy in Nariman Abasov, who's 28-3 and three Insane. on Dana White's Contender Series. I don't know how, like... I guess you look at Dana White's Contender Series as a funnel. A lot of these fighters, right before they get on the show, they just so happen to sign with one of those bigger management companies that you know on their Instagram, and then all of a sudden they're on Contender Series fighting for a slot in the UFC. You'd think some of them would have been discovered earlier and just ended up in the UFC based off merit alone, but those 10 and 10 or 12 and 12 contracts are kind of what they like to hand out. So when I do look at this one, Matt, very high talent level, obviously, for both of these guys. In this fight, you have Maheta before Ma Ma Mahatinya, I think it is, the, uh, yeah. the second Gabriel's nickname. But you do look at it here. Elder Bomfin is Ishmael. And when it comes down to this matchup, Abasov is the champion with AMC slash Fight Nights Global. High-ish level of competition, but his third to last fight, he took on a guy that was 4-1. and one. So it really is kind of sketchy, but fight in, fight out from Abasov. You get to see, you know, uh, uh, an interesting skill set that could translate well, maybe. Probably not at lightweight in the UFC. That remains to be seen. It's... I gotta, but you say that Justin Gaethje has a lot of success yeah. and he fights in a similar manner. That's the thing about Abasov. It's sort of like the Tai Tui Vasa theory. It's like rolling a roulette wheel. It's either going to land his way or it's not going to land his way. There's not much of an in-between there. It's black or white. And with Abasov, I do sort of like the skills he brings to the UFC. If he does make it to the organization, his run won't be boring. I think I can guarantee that. Let's say they give him, like, John McDessie in his UFC debut. You're telling me that wouldn't be an absolute banger? I just think Bond is a lot more technical. Now, here's the thing. It could come back to bite him. If Abasov can make it ugly, use his clinch a little bit, dirty box, go to the body, make it that brawl like he likes to do in the majority of his fights. And that's the thing. If he fights somebody who's 4-1 and one or 50-1, and one, he's going to fight them in the same manner. He's going to want to try to make it ugly and fight that brawl. So if Bond Fib can use his reach and his footwork and really use some of those good boxing combinations like he's been able to show throughout his career, it could look like a masterclass from him. And that's the interesting thing about this fight. It could just just be one way traffic one way or the other even though i do think it's a very close fight on paper because again abasov could make it ugly could go out there win like a 30 27 decision really put his physicality on bonfim or on the flip side bonfim goes to the body with his jab works his combinations up top and he could look like the far superior technician yeah bonfim very very good striker both brothers are very very technical when you look at it i mean gabriel Probably the better Bonfin out of the two. But Ishmael is very good as no well. Well-rounded. Very, very good striker. And for Abasov, the guy's kind of like an old-school Chuck Liddell. Like he's going to walk you down. He's going to throw hammers the entire time. Overhand right to close the distance. He'll try and dirty box. He'll try and take his opponents down. He is really, really good ground and pound. So it should be quite good that way. Jester, 53 people in the chat. Looks like two years ago. Jester. Dana White's Contender Series not as popular as the UFC. We're trying to make it. We're trying to get it moving. So keep that chat rolling. Let us know who you have in this matchup. It should be a good one, as was mentioned there by EPH. The fact that the odds are very close in this one, almost to pick them, makes it all the more interesting. So again, getting ourselves ready for the crescendo that is our light heavyweight feature. Our next fight, Matt, is between Carl Williams, who's 6 and 1, and Jimmy Lawson, who's 4 and 1. This one at heavyweight. Now, originally, this was supposed to be a completely different matchup, and we weren't actually supposed to have Carl Williams in. Now, if you went over to his Instagram, I think it was it was on September the 4th, he posted that, uh, yeah, I got a Not chance in the down. UFC. So he did weigh in at 233 pounds for this matchup. So you look at it that way, Lawson weighed in at 263 both polar opposite fighters and if you do focus in on it the original matchup that Lawson was supposed to have was against not Kevin Stefanski of your Cleveland Browns it was Kevin Zaflarski like Close. like like a backup QB version of Kevin Stefanski but for Zaflarski he had IMMAF experience he was a good fighter in his own right for Lawson I mean Matt he was a D1 uh wrestler at Penn State two national championships there in the two years that he decided to Pretty wrestle impressive. 
pretty impressive, I would say. If you look at it, he has a loss in his pro debut to Saeed Salma. But if you really think about it, Saeed Salma is a pretty darn good Bellator heavyweight. Now he has a split decision loss to Davion Franklin. That one's fair. I thought Salma won. In his next fight, he loses by split decision. But all that to say, it's a reputable loss to have on your record. But if you do go down through it, like I looked at the last two fights that he had. Knocks out Anthony Garrett in under a minute. Anthony Garrett, you might go, geez, Craig, you're talking about Bellator heavyweights. Remember the time that Jake Hager kneed Anthony Garrett in the nuts in the end of the fight? Yes, I do. Lawson was a minus 350 favorite in that fight. And in Lawson's last fight, he took on a man who was 5-4-1 and one in Marino Eatman. And Lawson was a minus 1,200 favorite in that fight. So he hasn't taken on a good level competition since losing to Saeed Salma. That's the thing. The skills are there, but it is very hard to defend a lot of the skill set that you see because a lot of the reasons you brought up. His stat sheet is a little bit padded if you look at his resume, but the skills are there and his foundation's very solid with that wrestling. And that's what I think could carry Lawson kind of... Not through the unranked contenders in heavyweight, but you get the idea. If you're really good at one thing in the heavyweight division, you can normally just rest on your laurels and end up riding into the top 15 that way. And if Lawson can translate his wrestling more effectively to MMA than he has shown as of late, then I do think he can have a lot of success. If Hamdi Abdullah Hub can do it in the UFC... Exactly. You can too, kids. Don't it, give up it, on your dreams. I, I would think that Lawson can, but the trouble is, I mean, he just mashes the buttons in a lot of his fights, and he just throws and doesn't block anything. He does get countered in some of the exchanges. He seems to have a pretty darn good chin. And he has, uh, it, like, he throws with a lot of power. The one thing that I think with Lawson is going to be cardio. Like, he's one of the bigger heavyweights. He's not a really tall guy. He expends a lot of energy in those first oh, yeah. bursts. His takedown defense is a little bit problematic. So, I, I do look at this as, I know Carl Williams is coming in on short notice. He's out of the U.S. Virgin Islands. He goes to American Top Team Atlanta. He... Started out his athletic career in track and field, and then he kind of wanted to move into martial arts, so that's kind of what got him to the dance, uh, wrestling, and then into MMA. I watched Carl Williams fight, Matt, and if he had like two more fights, I think it may, he could have made it into the UFC as a light heavyweight, and I don't know why the PFL decided to pass on him from PFL Challenger Series, because Williams is an incredibly diverse striker, and by that, I mean... He throws somewhat basic combinations, but he has speed, he has power, his wrestling translates into MMA, it definitely he has does. great control on the mat. Like, I really like the skill set I see out of Carl Williams, and I'm not making a pick on this one, but if Carl Williams won this fight, and listen, I don't even know, there weren't odds on this one earlier on today when I looked. There are now. There are now. Lawson's only a slight if ish favorite open minus 300 minus 195 and for williams open plus 240 plus 162 gv ckd spams l2 thank you for that super chat thank you i'm actually kind of surprised that the odds kind of you know slid in close because again I think Williams is a really good fighter. I do too. It's just that's the thing about the heavyweight division. If you are that one trick pony, that one trick can carry you very far. And if Lawson can use his wrestling more effectively, because the thing about Williams is he does have good MMA wrestling. He might not have the same level of a background as Lawson does, but Carl Williams still knows how to wrestle in a cage and in uh, an MMA atmosphere. So I agree with you. I can see Carl Williams having a lot of success, but it does feel like the UFC almost wants Lawson to win so that they can bring him in as, hey, this is our new sort of D1 one guy who's gonna look really well, good in the division yeah lawson to me like this fight seems like a bellator prelim like bit, yeah. they they love heavyweight like ross hilton rudy shafroth like fights like that they like doing fights like this so kind of surprised to see it here and i think either winner williams is probably the more ufc ready lawson maybe probably the, the higher ceiling i would say the hamdi abdullah hubs of the world so it should be a good one we look at our next fight matt and when we do consider it, I mean, you have the second bomb fim brother, and this one is Gabriel, 12-0 in MMA, recently awarded the vacant welterweight championship over with LFA at one of those LFA Brazil shows, so here you go. And now he's on Contender Series. He was originally supposed to take on Felix Klinkhammer, outsteps Klinkhammer, insteps Trey Waters, this one at 170 pounds. And I know a lot of people are going to be excited about this fight because... Bombfin's an LFA welterweight champ. He was also a Brazilian super welterweight champ in boxing where he went 5-0 from 2016 to 2017. Gabriel is the better Bombfin brother, I would say. Trey Waters does have a shot in this fight. It's just odd 
being on such short a notice. Exactly. That's the problem. Here's the thing. I'd probably pick Gabriel Bond for him no matter what. Like, even if it was on regular training camps. And now you're just adding the short notice aspect. The thing I will say about Waters is he's extremely big for the weight class. He's going to have physical advantages that Bond Fim just won't be able to make up for, really, no matter how much better he is skill wise. But the problem is, Bond Fim, you bring up his boxing. He's a pretty good grappler, though. Like, he has a number of submission wins. In fact, the majority of his wins come via submission. He hurts a lot of guys in the feet, can finish them on the ground. Let's say he does end up fighting a guy. I was going to say uh, Gregor Gillespie, but that'd be more apt to fight his brother. But you get the idea. A really traditionally top heavy wrestler, maybe a guy like that could give him a lot of trouble. Like, but the thing is, he can work off his back. He can scramble quite well. And his stand up is quite lethal. So I really do like him in this matchup specifically. Like a guy who's spent time at 170, 155, like a guy like Jesse Ronson, bomb fit. That'd be go. a decent introduction. And a former Ronson, uh, you know, opponent. Somebody like Nicholas Dalby. I think that would bring the best out of a guy like Bonfin. You're not going to get anywhere near the rankings just yet. But again, this should be a very, very good matchup. Then we move into the main event of the evening. You have the two guys right there. We have the votes and the polls up there in that comment section. So keep hitting it up and let us know who you have here. 54% have Hadolfo Bellato to get the win over Vitor Petrino. If you went back and watched their first fight... Uh, yeah, I mean, Petrino knocked out Bellotto in 25 seconds. He threw a left hook that started to drop Bellotto, and then he threw his right hand and just sunk him. And that was the end of that fight. So that was a pretty impressive pretty knockout. Pretty cool, I'm not going to lie. Pretty darn cool knockout there. But when I do look at this matchup, kind of the weirdest part about it is the after effects for Petrino. Because he goes from beating Bellotto, a guy who already had some experience. He was already 5-0 in MMA before he fought a pro debuting Petrino, you look at it for Petrino, then goes on to fight a guy who's 0-0, making his debut, 1-17, 0-6, 0-0, and then get Chimrad Antigulov. You know, get Chimrad Antigulov, I guess I should say. Formerly just a world beater until he fought like five decent guys in the UFC, and yeah. they sent him away. But when you do look at this matchup, Matt, for Petrino, even in his last fight against a guy who likes to try and take you down, likes to throw hammers, get a lot of top pressure... Petrino beat the brakes off Antigulov for all of that fight. He took Antigulov down. He knocked him down. He obviously finished him by TKO, but he did really look good in that fight. That was almost a year to the day ago on UAE Warriors 22, a card that if you go back and look at it, a lot of UFC talent signed off of that one card. If you look at it for Bellato, he did, again, get some experience over with LFA when they made the stops down in Brazil. But you look at both these guys for Petrino, very, very good with his hands. And we saw that, of course, in the first fight. But for Bellotto, the thing that you didn't get to see, this guy's pretty well a wizard on the ground. And he could end up like a Venetius Mohea. I was thinking like an Andrea Muniz. Like, think about the career Muniz had before he came to the UFC and got other runnies on right now. Had a lot of TKO losses. I think he has, what, three of them in his career? Like, Muniz doesn't have this squeaky clean record that makes you think, wow, he is going to become champion one day. But, like, you could probably sit me down and make a pretty compelling argument that he has a path to the title. Beating Izzy is another story, but you get the idea. Like, he's that level of fighter now. So, for Bellato, I could see him having sort of a similar career trajectory because he is so good on the mat with his grappling and with his submission. He can threaten basically everything. Legs, arms, head. He's that three-level grappler, if you will. Really good control. Really good at back-taking, too. Phenomenal with a rear naked choke. I think he is the more skilled guy, but the problem is, Petrino makes you pay for every entry, and he is a very damaging fighter, and that is the good thing about him. He doesn't just need the knockout because he can't hurt you on the way to a knockout or even a decision win. I just will be curious to see what's going to happen after that first round if we do make it there. If the explosiveness of Petrino is going to last, if he is on the receiving end of a lot of takedown attempts because let's say he is defending takedowns has to get up from the bottom is that parry or is that power sorry going to carry late into the fight that's yet to be seen but i'm going to be very curious about this fight and good on the ufc for giving Bellato a second chance because again he got done pretty dirty that first time around and it is good to see them being like hey we understand you're still really skilled but Trino, like you would said has had sort of a weird career after that first fight so get them back in there and hopefully the winner's rewarded with a contract their first fight was in 2019 this this fight was announced back in May. So a big buildup for both of these guys. And that was another thing. Like there's a few fighters here that have known about their fights for months and months and they've been getting ready for them. So it really is good to see. But you know the show. I mean, this is the Contender Series show completely different from the rest of the Fight Night Picks programming. We make one pick, Matt. You get a chance to redeem yourself. You get a ch chance to get off the schneid. And there are some really big favorites. And of course, you know, everybody that watches Contender Series knows that favorites don't always Ever. win. 
hardly ever whatsoever. But when you're making a pick on this card, who are you going with? So go to Best Fight Odds for me really quick, if you don't mind. All because right. here's the thing. I agree with you. I do think Gabriel uh, Bonfim is the better of the Bonfim brothers. But for where the odds are... I kind of like his brother Ishmael in that fight. I do think he is the more technical guy, and I think that if he can stay on the back foot, for even odds, it's hard not to pick the more technical guy. If he is able to land on the in-betweens, land with combinations, I do like his volume a lot more in that matchup, but the problem is, and I can admit this too, I think if we were doing a fight of the night screen, that might be the fight that we give it to. It's a very closely contested matchup between two guys who are already probably UFC ready, and that's why it's a damn shame that they have to fight each other to sort of make it onto the show. One has to cannibalize the other talent, because I have to be completely honest with you, I could see a world where both guys make it into the UFC and have decent careers. I'm not predicting they're going to be the next Sean Brady or anything like that, but I do think they could go and have decent careers at the UFC level. I mean, for me, hey, brother, going with Gabriel Bonfin. Well, no I wonder. Mean, when, I, when I do look at this card, Matt, and again, this is the thing. Who's the most UFC-ready fighter on the entire card? Gabriel Bonfin is that guy, so I picked that fighter. If it wasn't Bonfin, it would be Teresa Bleda. But the trouble is she's an even bigger favorite, like twice as much of a favorite. So when I do look at this matchup, it does scare me a little bit because I went with a fighter like Bombfin in Amiran Gogoladze a few weeks ago against Darius Flowers and I absolutely got burned. But when I do look at this matchup for Bombfin, so adept on the ground, and that's kind of like the, the secondary skill, if you will, just because of his striking and how good it is. So for Waters... It like was Carl like, Robertson almost. Well, when you do look at this one, and I wanted to make sure I said this, uh, Top Turtle Podcast threw it out there on Twitter. It was announced on August 26th that Waters was going to be taking this fight. So great opportunity for him. I just like the level of competition for Bombfin. I like the fights that I've seen out of him. So Matt, the Brothers Allen going with the Brothers Bombfin. Wow. What a show. I, you couldn't write it any better, folks. Matt's mind is blown. A big time episode of the Contender Series previews. If you want to toss us a like, it is definitely appreciated. As you well know, we do have a big time show coming up at the end of the uh, the, the week, I guess I should say. And I'm just trying to pull it up right there. And I will because we do, of course, have, look at that, Hamzat Shemaev. Nate Diaz, Lee Jingliang taking on Tony Ferguson coming up this weekend. Question mark kicks, the fight night picks, sidekicks, all of that good stuff. You can find here on the channel. If you haven't watched that video, go out there, tune into it. The individual videos will come out shortly. But Matt, it is a big week of fights. And I know Contender Series really heating up. They're signing a lot of these prospects. And I think this is going to be a great episode tomorrow. It should be a great episode. And again, you got to join us for that pay-per-view at the end of the week. I know, again, I can admit it. I was a little down on it myself. But that main card is going to be phenomenal. Lee Jingliang versus Tony Ferguson is a guaranteed match match of a fireworks you have two people who throw a lot of volume can throw with big power are fairly durable at the ufc level i think that's gonna be a great fight and in the main event nate diaz is being brought into loose let's be completely honest but if anybody's gonna pull a screw job over on the ufc it'd be nate diaz in his last fight on his contract it's a compelling storyline it really is this might be the most wwe pay-per-view the ufc has ever held in their entire history so i'm really excited for the pay-per-view can't wait for it you're gonna have to keep it locked in with fight nate pips and as we always say let's get, get into it, it.